In his book on aesthetics and Nazi politics, translated in 2004 as The Cult of Art in Nazi Germany, Eric Michaud, director of studies at the École des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris, wrote that National Socialist attention to the arts was intended to present the broken German folk with an image of its eternal Geist and to hold up to it a mirror capable of restoring to it the strength to love itself. I came upon this, among other ideas of Michaud, when preparing the conceptual framework for my own book, In Humanities, uh, just released. Considering his book last year, I found a number of Michaud's concepts very intriguing, but only made general references to them in my introduction and conclusion. The gist of these ideas will be familiar to readers of George Mossy, whom Michaud should have cited more vigorously. However, I found that Michaud put some of the key concepts of the history of Nazi culture more strongly than I have read elsewhere, and also that they seemed to resonate with much of the material I uncovered in my own research. Above all, Michaud ins insisted that Nazi cultural politics was not just a matter of propagandizing the party platform in cultural terms. Instead, he insisted that it was a central component of the National Socialist worldview, with an active, not merely reflective, role in the life and actions of the Nazi party and regime. As Michaud put it, we cannot account for this phenomenon by simply resorting to the term propaganda and assuming that Nazism was making art serve its political ends. To see what Mossy termed Nazi culture as mere propaganda is an underestimation of its seminal function in the workings of National Socialism. In Michaud's words again, through Nazi representations of cultural history, the Geist, the internal or spiritual Reich, was phenomenalized. Hitler was convinced that German art contained the power that could save the sick Germans. In answer to party militants who questioned the need to sacrifice so much to art, he retorted confidently that what had to be achieved was no less than the strengthening of the protective moral armor of the nation. Thus did references to the history of Western humanities, as constructed according to a fairly long-standing Germanic point of view, have a formative function in the Nazi program. Through them, the folk would, as Michaud wrote, fabricate its own ideal image that would constitute the model and guide capable of propelling it toward its own salvation. Neither the state, said Hitler, nor propaganda, said Goebbels, were goals. They were means to a broader end. Nor was art ever a goal in itself. The ultimate goal was not even the production of the Reich as a work of art, but the formation of a people comprised of new men. Cultural history then, perceived in these politicized terms, was a literal remedy for the symptoms of German decline that Nazis feared. Having set forth these ideas, along with many others, Michaud's book was generally well received, but it was criticized somewhat for a lack of grounding in primary source research. While I found his examples to be fresh and well chosen, I will not quibble with these assessments. Instead, I would like to take this opportunity to compare some of his basic points with the detailed information my book has revealed about Nazi cultural politics as manifested in the arts coverage of the main Nazi newspaper, the Volkischer Beobachter. Thus, this presentation constitutes a brief synthesis of his analysis and some of the material that appears in my book. Let me provide a quick overview of Inhumanities. It analyzes how the Volkische Beobachter presented the history of Western culture according to the themes of the National Socialist worldview. Based on analysis of every major article, the Volkische Beobachter published about art, literature, and music, including coverage of good German types like Socrates, Alexander the Great, Dante, Machiavelli, Leonardo, and Michelangelo, through Durer, Mozart, Moses Mendelssohn, Goethe, Heine, Beethoven, Schopenhauer, Wagner, Nietzsche, and Mahler, up to contemporaries like the Mann brothers, Schoenberg, Einstein, and many, many others along the way. This research demonstrates how Nazi Germany attempted to appropriate not only the other Germany of poets, poets and thinkers, but the history of Western humanities as a whole. Nazi leaders viewed their movement as the culmination of Western civilization, or Kultur, and my book leads readers through their cultural self-justification. As this blurb indicates, moving from my earlier work on music reception, I have traced in humanities, in inhumanities, Nazi interpretations of other genres as well. 
But for the purposes of this paper, I will again concentrate on examples drawn from the newspaper's invocations of the serious music tradition, particularly its references to Richard Wagner. Throughout the pages of the Volkische Beobachter, music was unquestionably deemed as people like Pamela Potter and Celia Applegate and many others, including many people sitting here, um, the most German of arts. And moreover, that Richard Wagner in particular was identified as the most German of all Germans. All this said, let me now outline a few of Michaud's more specific points about Nazi culture before turning to an assessment of how some of this material validates his positions. A primary point that Michaud made was that Nazi cultural politicians strove to increase German self-confidence by constructing an idealized self-image based on the supposed German place in Western cultural traditions. Or in his, in his words, to make the genius of the race visible to that race and thereby restore its faith in itself by making it conscious of its historic mission. A second major concept Michaud posited was that of the Führer as artist. Michaud identified Hitler's public persona as a culmination of the romantic exaltation of the artist as spiritual leader. In his words, Hitler presented himself not only as a man of the people and a soldier with frontline experience, but also and above all as a man whose artistic experience constituted the best guarantee of his ability to mediate the folk spirit. Clearly also, Michel contended, the construction of the ideal simultaneously constituted the construction of the other, with all that this opposition implied. Again, in his words, the appearance of Hitler always entailed, as its corollary, the progressive disappearance of all enemies who were rejected by the folk community. Returning to the supposedly positive implications of these constructs, Michaud then contended that Nazi insistence that followers, followers revere past creative leaders was much more about the present and future of the German becoming Nazi nation than the past. As Michaud wrote, the task of each work of art or interpretation thereof was not just to represent, but to prepare for the realization of the ideal Reich. Finally, as the last chapter of my book traces, the culmination of Nazi culture was, with catastrophic consequences, the Second World War itself. Michaud, too, identified the ultimately military implications of the Nazi mobilization of culture for party and national purposes. When it became a matter of defending the community, Goebbels conflated the struggle of the soldier, that of the worker, and that of the creator of culture. Art, he pontificated, is not a distraction for times of peace. Rather, it too is a spiritual and trenchant weapon for war. Again, I don't feel that Michaud presented these points without sufficient evidence, but it would be a useful exercise to assess these points with reference to some of the specific materials that I've presented in Humanities. Today, of course, I will concentrate on Volkischer Beobachter of uh, reception of Wagner, but also some comparative examples of other major composers. Regarding the first of these themes, and indeed Michaud's pivotal point, that Nazi cultural politics intended to increase German self-confidence, it is clear that this truly was the message of virtually every Volkischer Beobachter article covered in my book. All of the paper's cultural historical commemorations contributed this effort to bolster faith in the creative folk community. This was indeed their main function. And this is powerfully evident in the newspaper's relentless insistence on and never-ending celebration of the perceived notion that all the great composers of the Western music tradition were German or alternatively Germanic, Aryan, or Nordic. In its music reception, for instance, the Volkischer Beobachter worked intensively to appropriate Bach into Germanic and therefore national socialist culture. In Bach's personality, the paper argued, would combine the best hereditary powers of a healthy species, and therefore his art constituted a culmination of racial development. For the editors of the Volkische Beobachter, an immediate concern regarding the case of Mozart was to evaluate his blood heritage. According to the paper, despite his wide travels, Mozart preserved the German inheritance of his birth, pure and unadulterated. Thus, it was a German who raised Italian opera to its perfect ideal state and then brought it to his own people. Most intensively, 
The Nazi party injected race issues into its Beethoven reception. Indeed, dictates of racial anthropology nearly nullified the composer's value as a party hero. Portraits and observations of Beethoven by his contemporaries reveal that he had few of the physical characteristics associated with Aryan stereotypes. Noticing this, a handful of pseudoscientists concluded that Beethoven was of impure blood. To counter notions that the composer might have been a mix of mixed racial stock, the Volkischer Beobachter vouched for his purity in articles produced to cleanse Beethoven of supposed physical flaws, and blue eyes, among other things. Right? Surprisingly, efforts to ensure that a cultural figure was of certifiably pure German origins were even necessary in the case of Richard Wagner. And I won't go through the details of the question of Gaia's uh, 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 involvement in his, in his birth. From time to time, the paper related, the old swindle kept arising that one of the greatest German geniuses of all, Richard Wagner, had Jewish blood in his veins. The focus of the Obachter strove to overcome this filth and break through these lies once and for all with a two-pronged argument. First, by demonstrating that relations between Gaia and Wagner's mother were innocent until they married, and then by insisting that by, in any case, Gaia was not Jewish. As the paper had it, it was absolutely certain, according to the portraits that we have, that Gaia had a completely German head without the slightest indication of alien blood. So like the whole house of lies built up by Jewish wiles, this mendacious construction would ultimately fall apart to the shame and disgrace of Judah. Returning to Michaud, in his words, a declared aim to turn German art into a promise of German happiness became a rallying cry for all the nationalists in the Third Reich. Hitler could not fail to win their support when he wrote, how many people are aware of the infinite number of separate memories of the greatness of our natural fatherland in all the fields of the cultural and historical life? It is clear that Volkischer Beobachter coverage of the Western music tradition, including Wagner, insisted that this indeed was the greatest field of German cultural prowess. Michaud's second theme, the concept of the Fuhrer artist, ultimately leads to an even more immediate association being cr between creators, especially Wagner and Nazi leadership. As Michaud put it, the fact that the Fuhrer was also called the artist of all artists placed him immediately at the heart of the Western tradition that assigned to art the most decisive of functions. In the case of music reception, in the Volkische Beobachter, the correlate to Michaud's assertions about Hitler as Fuhrer artist is the paper's constant insistence that great creators, including writers, artists, and composers, were simultaneously political, each in their own way, artist Fuhrer. For example, even the liturgical music of Bach was less important to the Volkische Beobachter as an expression of faith than as a national symbol. People had often referred to Bach's works as a musical incarnation of Protestantism, the paper argued, but it achieved much more outside the mere context of music, managing to represent the musical component of the culture of Friedrich II's Prussian state. Mozart, too, according to the Volkische Beobachter, was strongly driven by nationalist impulse. His patriotic mission, it insisted, was to replace Italian fashion with a genuinely German opera tradition. Some political biography, uh, selective biography was necessary in the case of Beethoven. They had to overcome the fact that he had had revolutionary fever uh, in the early days. Uh, but it ultimately countered that although he had been exposed to French revolutionary ideals, he was always a Rhinelander at heart. But of all the creators that the Volkischer Beobachter extolled as politically motivated, Wagner was its ideal. Given his engagement with 19th century pol German political culture, this was not a stretch. Still, it is remarkable how intensively the paper emphasized political, uh, Wagner's political writings. As it put it, the writings were essential, not marginal, to understanding the composer. As an extension of his artistic works, they testified to the sureness of his political perception and political will. Of course, what the paper's writers found most resonant with National Socialist outlook were the folkish components of Wagner's politics. In their view, the, comp the composer was the pathfinder of the German resurrection, since he directed the folk back to the roots of its nature found in Germanic mythology. Under the title, Richard Wagner's Battle for the Folkish Ideal, 
The paper held that the composer felt himself ever strengthened by his German-Germanic thoughts and constantly sought to realize this spirit. Nazis admired the prophetic foresight of Wagner, who saw through the spirit of the revolutionaries of 1848 and 49 with bitter disappointment, and anticipating future developments, turned away from liberal efforts without hope. All of his writings were therefore the worthiest weapons for the final battle that approached. His ideas were so similar to those of National Socialism, said the paper, that in the speeches of young Germany, that is Hitler's above all, it seemed like one was hearing Richard Wagner speaking to the folk. This was a sign that the Third Reich of Richard Wagner, the, in, that in the Third Reich of Richard Wagner, the Fuhrer principle of genius would prevail more than ever. Thus did the music historical material that appeared in the Fokashi Beobachter resound with the Fuhrer artist, artist Fuhrer theme that Michaud identified throughout Nazi cultural politics. And I'll skim over a little bit of my rhetoric there and move on to Michaud's point, next point, about the simultaneous construction of the opponent in contrast to the Germanic ideal posited in Nazi culture. In his terms, correlatively, Nazism deployed violence against all those who were likely to place in doubt that the lost object could be resurrected in the race and in art. Ultimately, according to Michaud, it was this cultural thrust that led to the politics of exter extermination. Thus did Michaud intensify the notion, which George Mossy originally postulated, that even anti-Semitism was predicated on cultural criticism. Kultur was the key and determinant factor in identifying the other, based on Hitler's clearly stated standards of judgment. Do you make it, imitate it, or to destroy it? According to the Volkische Beobachter, especially Heinrich Heine, but also the composers Meyerbeer, Mendelssohn, Mahler, and Schoenberg supposedly did the latter two things, so they and their kind had to be eradicated. In treating this point as manifested in music historical terms throughout the pages of the Volkische Beobachter, it is necessary to address the place of Wagner's anti-Semitism in the paper's rhetoric. From its earlier days, earliest days, its cultural co coverage emphasized Wagner's treatment of the Jewish issue. As early as 1920, which is the year in which they purchased the newspaper, the paper presented extracts from Judaism and music, which the paper subsequently relied upon more so than anything else the composer produced. According to the paper, Judaism and music was more relevant than ever, seeming as if it had been written yesterday, not a half century ago. The only difference being that, in the meantime, everything that Wagner prophesied had become true. Therefore, the Volkische Beobachter continued, Wagner was for Nazis more than an ingenious creator of phenomenal works of art. He gave them beautiful words for their difficult path out of the harsh present to a better and purer future. Close investigation, moreover, reveals that while not every one of his operas was appropriated in anti-Semitic terms, Lohengrin and Die Meistersinger were often invoked in the paper, but as celebrations of Germanness, not attacks on Jews, however much Beckmesser may appear to be stereotyped. The smoking gun proving that Nazis brandished Wagner's works in their anti-Jewish plot is found in the paper's reception of the ring. Some of the strongest statements about anti-Semitic stereotypes in Wagner's music dramas were contained in a 1923 article on the World War in the Ring of the Nibelungen. Dramatically and musically, according to the paper, Wagner anticipated the tragedies of the World War by depicting the fight for power symbolized in the ring. In Alberich, Wagner embodied the dark spirit of Jewish mammonism, whose ghastly form confronts us in the capitalism of the industrial age, the epitome of loveless and cold-hearted business interests. It was in this form that mammonism came to rule the world, the paper held, clearly marked by the characteristics of the atrocious mixed bloods whom the master gave voice through Hagen. The racial mixing implied here was of particular concern to the paper. What caused the fall of the Roman Empire? the racial mush brought about by its global politics. 
And Aryan Germanic humanity was threatened with the same end because the World War not only cost the German race more than three million of its strongest men, but introduced many thousand colored soldiers into Europe, resulting in the infection and deterioration of the blood of the European humanity to a shocking, unprecedented extent. With infallible certainty, then, Wagner prefigured in Hagen the dreadful catastrophe that haunted European humanity in general and the German folk in particular. Indeed, this was the background to the heartbreaking tragedy of the last offensive of 1918. Ultimately, the paper contended we must not overlook the fact that this battle for world control was a struggle over blood, that is, race, exactly as in the Tetralogy. Moving beyond the war itself, the paper insisted that one finds in the relationship between Siegfried and Mima a reflection of our times, the ugly dwarf, an embodiment of the haggling Jew who wants to raise higher and higher, like all the Eastern Jews crossing over the German borders, is Siegfried's foster parent. Significantly, though, he doesn't raise the hero out of love. He does so only to arrange that Siegfried kill the dragon Fafner to capture the ring and the hoard for him. When all this is done, Mima will cut off his head. Here, in the paper's opinion, Wagner signified the fact that the Jew must exploit the powerful labor forces of the Nordic race to his own advantages. But while Mima speculates thus, his son forges his own sword of victory with which he will slay the dragon. And since only one who can forge the sword of victory is he who knows no fear, Siegfried is the embodiment of National Socialism, which alone possesses the courage to break the chains of slavery around the German people. In this vein, the paper made further links between Wagner's Ring Cycle and Weimar-era Germany via apocalyptic attacks on modern operas, especially Ernst Krenig's Johnny spielt auf. Western civilization is going down while striking up Johnny. As an antidote, an affirmation of Wagner's idealism was more urgent than ever, and that make, meant making a clear distinction between a dark, the dark blue tones of the Valhalla motif and the cacophonous howling of the saxophone that would be more appropriate for accompanying lewd dances around the golden calf. The barbarization process that we are experiencing is all, is all Albrecht's work. If you don't take this seriously, the paper warned, you're going to go down in the fall with them. Now is the time to recognize and fight the enemy. Fight with word and deed against the fate that is approaching. According to this millenarian view, as the world falls apart, those who have renounced love for gold, the Albrechts, Mimas, and Hagens, will disappear in the flood rolling in, and only pure men and women, free of Albrecht's curse, will be able to rebuild it. So fellow Germans must purify themselves and band together in a new brotherhood of the rail. This, the paper preached, is what Wagner tells us in his ring cycle. For the most part, <clears throat> the editors and contributors of the Focus Should Be Off Bachter concentrated on his non-musical sources, especially Judaism and music. However, as regards the music itself, it was in the ring tetralogy that National Socialist Wagnerians perceived the Meister's voice as harmonizing most perfectly with that of the Fuhrer. Above all, however, Michaud postulated that National Socialist invocations of past creative leaders were intended as symbolic indications of what the new Germany would become, not just validations of present Nazi policies and ideas with references to the past. As he put it, the awakening into the myth was generally conceived as an awakening to the present, a recapitulation of the past directed toward the future. <clears throat> Throughout the paper's music coverage, we can find examples of direct associations of composers and their works with the Nazi party and its plans for the future. I'll, try to, I'll skim over these. How is the, how is the time? Are we Oh, right, okay, yeah, okay. So, so Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, future, language of the future, invaluable. But the most famous and often repeated version of this point in Folkisch Beobachter music reception was reference to the Wach auf chorus of Wagner's Meistersinger. Michaud argues specifically that this injunction to Germany, which urged it to awake, awaken, was primarily a call to remember its past, 
and to construct its future on the ideal model of that past. And then a couple of ex examples from the uh, 1933 uh, anniversary of, um, of, of Wagner's death, which was uh, timed terribly for, um, for, or well, depending on one's perspective. But I'll skip to um, the event at which Hitler himself most publicly expressed his personal engagement with Wagner during the second year of the Reich, uh, when on March 6th, 1934, he dedicated a monument to Wagner in Leipzig, sanctifying it as a testament of solemn promises to live up to the wish and will of the master, to continue maintaining his everlasting works in an ever lively beauty, and to draw coming generations of our folk into the miraculous world of this mighty tone poet. Given that he was evidently invoking the poet and Meistersinger Hans Sachs on this occasion, it should come as no surprise that the foundation stone bore the words, honor your German masters, and reference not only to Wagner, but to the future of a newly Nazified German culture as a whole. And just a bit on the war, and then I'll, <coughs> that will be the end. Ultimately, however, this process of national renewal involved going to war. From a popular perspective, given the horrible outcomes of Nazi geopolitical and military policy, it's natural to assume that the Second World War itself was the primary goal of the regime. But Michaud helps us to remember that it's, the war itself was not the goal. It was a means to an end, and that end was, in his view, this realization of the new man according to the image of Germany as the Kulturnation formulated in part by the Volkischer Beobachter cultural section and then moving to the Wagner examples of that. As it had done in the service of so much of its cultural coverage to exemplify the alignment between artistic creation and the Nazi war effort, the paper placed its strongest emphasis on Wagner. <clears throat> in the summer of 1941, for example, just eight days after German forces invaded the Soviet Union, the paper made direct associations between his music dramas and the New Front. According to the paper, Goethe Dameron, could be interpreted as presaging the positive outcome of the Barbarossa campaign. The stormy tempo and powerful events of the conflict were bringing the German folk closer than ever to recognition of the deepest meanings of the ring, of the connections between great art and the folkish war of liberation. In the ring cycle, Wagner shaped the inevitable historical progression of an old rotten world toward self-immolation into a gigantic cultural symbol. The fall of the Valhalla gods wasn't a catastrophe, but a great process of purification, relieving the world of enormous guilt. Still, as everyone in the room knows, the most extreme and infamous use of Wagner culture for the aims of Nazi Germany at war was the series of wartime festivals at Bayreuth. Houston Stewart Chamberlain, the paper related, once said that, that the Festspielhaus was a battle sign, a standard around which those who remained true would gather armed for war. And this prophecy was being realized at the wartime festivals. And I had a few there pages of this in the newspaper as well as the book, but I'll go to whatever I finished with and say that to provide soldiers and workers with this unforgettable pleasure was an achievement that could only have occurred in Adolf Hitler's Reich. From this spectacle, the fewer guests at the festival learned to know that greater Germany, the Germany that not only fought for its existence and its global validity with weapons, but which, as in earlier centuries and millennia, was called forth to spread its cultural heritage across borders and stand as a model for other peoples. Knowing of the utter devastation it wrought, we reject the National Socialist promotion of the war as leading to a future of German cultural advancement. Still, we must recognize that Nazi propaganda did not present the war as an end in itself, but as a mean toward reestablishing Germany as Kulturnation. In this endeavor, they failed. The final result was instead the reduction of their country to a state of ruin far more hideous than those that Albert Speer had projected in plans for structures he and his masters imagined. Not after thousands of years, but after just 12 years of terror and six years of carnage. Ultimately, the culmination of Nazi culture was the war itself, a hollow masterpiece. But Michaud's arguments, combined with evidence compiled from the Volkische Beobachter cultural section, in particular its treatment of the Western music tradition and especially its invocations of Wagner and his works, help us to understand better what impelled these destructive forces. The ironic realization is that, however distorted, they were originally conceived in creative 
terms. Thank, thank you very much for that great talk. I would actually have a question, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just open it up to the audience. But if there isn't a question, I'll ask, oh, you have a question. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, thank you, David. This uh, was very informative. Now, bearing in mind that the focus of Beobachter was the party paper, uh, I wonder whether you could give us an idea as to the extent to which what you told us about uh, was actually uh, actually grew on uh, on party soil, um, and the extent to which uh, other disciplines, let's say, contributed to the kind of uh, um, um, view of culture that you described. I'm thinking in particular of the uh, contributions of German Musikwissenschaft and lit Literaturwissenschaft, because what you told us about, this did not really uh, come out of the minds of those, uh, uh, of those critics uh, or, or um, Folkische Beobachter journalists that did the feuilleton for it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is, uh, we're all aware of that. And, uh, and, of, and of course, the, 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 the main line of this is not, uh, is not new to you. It's the detail and some of the nuance that's placed on it, I think, is what's added by looking through this. But also the fact that here in the newspaper, this is being pushed out toward a wider public. We're not reading what, uh, what uh, Celia was, uh, was talking about today, which fascinates me as somebody who's been interested and involved with this reception theory. So actually getting you know, really down and, and, and learning what people who read this newspaper might have thought and responding to it. But the, all of this is being drawn from or contributed directly by the, 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 this, this established tradition that goes back, we'll say at least to Houston Stewart Chamberlain, there are, and, and I do su summarize and identify as many of the authors as I can, and they range from uh, active and important uh, scholars to uh, 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 Josef Stol Stolzing is the, is the author of this article on uh, the, f the Ring in the First World War. He's editor of the cultural section for many years of the, of the Folkische Beobacht, but also many anonymous contributors. So you have to ask yourself, do they really believe this or is this is a way that they can actually sell an article to the Folkische Beobachter and so on. So those questions certainly come up, uh, the complexity of that. But there's no doubt that this is, uh, this is being drawn from the tradition that uh, Hans uh, mentions. Well, not accepting, not accepting that. right, right. Now, in the specific material that I cover in the book, where I'm, I, of course, there's the, the animus toward jazz and 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 uh, African American culture seeping in that way, but. Um, I mean, uh, Jeffrey Herf has talked about the anti-Semitic propaganda on the front pages of the Folkische Beobachter. Somebody, I don't think I want to do it, needs to write a book on the totality of that newspaper and deal with all of these issues. So in the case of this, it would be Roosevelt as in the pocket of the Jews, that kind of thing. Well, this is for World War I, and, and not so much I see what, yeah. Right. Yeah. The thing that they launch, that, that, that in that particular vein, it's just consistent harping on the, uh, the use of African troops by the French in Ryland. That's, true. That, that's the specific point that they come to. I think, we, I think we have time for one more question. Bill, over there. Uh, Josef Stolzin Czerny was a key figure. It so happened he was, um, had come from Munich and he had a background as a music critic. And um, already in 1909, a full decade before he and uh, Michael Georg Konrad 
were the two figures who introduced the Bayreuth Circle to Hitler, or the other way around, Hitler to the Bayreuth Circle, uh, he wrote, for instance, the following, quote, just as the followers of Muhammad fall awestruck to their knees at the, ex at the sight of Mecca, so are we Germans gripped at once at the sight of the old Margraveal residence town, that is Bayreuth, when we contemplate the works of Richard Wagner as the peak and goal of German artistic creation, unquote. It was a long-standing kind of um, quasi fundamentalist religious fixation or obsession here. Um, and indeed, it had much to do with Chamberlain as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, we've, we, one, when one generally reads of the Volker Schaubeobachter, it's Alfred Rosenberg. Well, he contributes a few things. But it, you know, if I were to write a paper or, or an, uh, you know, cover the history of, of the impact of these ideas had, Stolzing would be a major figure because he has this outlet and he is really pushing this out strongly. So, and not just in the music vein, but in all of these areas. He's writing a lot of these commemorative articles. So, you know, he's someone that maybe my book puts on the map a little bit along with, with some of those other uh, lesser known figures. Okay, thank you very much, David. Thank you.